Thank you for staying with KTN Farmers TV and welcome to This Week in Agriculture. On today's show, I'm joined by Caleb Karuga. Welcome to the show, Caleb. Thank you, sir. Tell us a little bit about what you do. Um, I'm into poultry. That is the indigenous chicken, what we call kienyeji. I'm also into horticulture, uh, the usual managu skumeki spinach. And recently we got into chili farming. Uh, that's, this is our fourth month and so far so good. Uh, I'm also doing beekeeping, a uh, bit of fish farming, uh, the catfish variety. And I do a lot of consultancy uh, across the value chains, mm. people who come to my farm or I go to their farms. And I'm an advocate of climate smart agriculture. Okay, awesome. I remember when you started, you used only to do chicken. What happened? You've done... I had to diversify uh -huh. and I work, uh, I had to come up with an ecosystem. Mm. Because if you look at the cost of fees, it's going up every day. So I had to look for an alternative that if I'm selling Sukuma Wiki to the market, whatever doesn't make to market, mm -hmm. all right, I can give my chicken. Uh, I'm doing a lot of water harvesting because, you know, in Kenya when it rains, it pours. So the water that I'm harvesting in a water pan and I have a dam liner, automatically I became a fish farmer. So I became a fish farmer really by accident. And when you look at the environment, how we've messed up the environment, and uh, pollination is not taking place because we've killed all the bees around, mm -hmm. I thought probably if I did a few beehives, then my farm and people around my place will notice an increase in their productivity because of pollination, hence the bees. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. I'm sure our viewers will benefit from our conversation today. Thank you. For so having. we had prepared a few um, uh, stories that we wanted to look at that mm -hmm. have been uh, trending in the, uh, in the course of the week. Okay. Let's start by looking at one of them. The Cabinet Secretary for Agriculture, Peter Munya, officially flagged off the Kenya Climate Smart Agriculture Project vehicles for 24 counties. The objective of the project is to transform the communities in the target project area by having more women as beneficiaries, increasing the productivity of selected crops, livestock and aquaculture value chains, and boosting their resilience through promoting agricultural technology innovations and management practices suitable for these areas. The five-year project is funded to a tune of $279.7 million. In partnership with the World Bank, farmers from semi-arid and non assol counties are set to benefit from the Kenya Climate Smart Agriculture Project by becoming more resilient to climate change through various trainings. Some of the counties that will benefit include Machakos, Marsabit, Taita Taveta, Nyeri, Kisumu, Bomet, and Elgeo Marakwet, among others. Passing on the 24 counties where the project is implemented, a total of, of 2,164 community micro projects estimated to cost 1.5 billion have been approved and ready for implementation. A further 828 million shillings has been allocated to support long-term training through assisting the national agriculture research systems in matters innovations, management practices, and dissemination of technology. After the implementation of this project, we expect to transform the communities in the target project areas by having more women as beneficiaries, increasing the productivity of selected crops, livestock, and aquaculture value chains and boosting their resilience through promoting agricultural technologies, innovations, and management practices suitable for these areas. This is in line with the goals and aspirations of realizing 100% food and nutrition security under the Big Four agenda of the national government. The five-year development project will be implemented under the following five thematic components, that is... One, upscaling climate-smart agricultural practices. Two, strengthening climate-smart agricultural research and seed systems. Three, supporting agro-weather, market, climate, and advisory services. Four, project coordination and management. Five, contingency emergency responses. So those are the, the, the five thematic components that this project uh, is targeting. Sears highlighted that the remaining 35 vehicles, mainly for the arid areas, will be released soon to support the project. That we continue to play our role as the national government 
in collaboration with development partners to enhance the capacity of the counties and our research institutions by releasing a total of 26 vehicles out of the 61 that we intend to release to the field under this project. I'm informed that the remaining 35 vehicles, mainly for the arid areas, will be released soon to support this project work. I wish from the outset to thank the World Bank, who are our partners in this project for the finances and the technical support the bank has extended in this project. The flagging of these four-wheel drive vehicles are seen to facilitate the duties of Kenya Climate Smart Agricultural Projects in the next five years within the 24 counties. Maron Munyao reporting for KTN Farmers TV. Caleb, mm -hmm. you've talked about uh, being an ambassador of uh, Climate Smart Agriculture. Yeah. This is uh, an example of what the government thing is doing. Yeah. Do you think it is enough? Oh, wow. Um, I think the elephant in the room mm -hmm. is we are not intentional enough. That's what I'm going to use this year. Mm -hmm. We are not intentional enough in our interventions. And the government has started. It's, it's, a, it's a good starting point. Poverty is sexist. Okay. Uh, women suffer first and recover last. Mm -hmm. So unless we are very intentional in the way we intervene, number one, Women don't have access to the assets. Mm. They don't have control of the assets. You're looking at land and let's say a logbook to a motor vehicle. They don't even have, a, have access or control of the markets. And I'll start with the assets bit of it. Who owns the, the land? We live in a patriarchal society. It's the man. Mm -hmm. So if the man is going drinking um, and the woman wants to invest in farming, she will not be allowed to take the title deed to go to a bank and access a loan. Sure. She cannot control and say, you know what, dear husband, I want the logbook to our motor vehicle to access a loan in a microfinance and invest in farming. Mm. But then the conversation moves. Since we do not want to mess up with the existing patriarchal society or system, how do we intentionally say we are going to bank on women, pun intended, mm -hmm. get these women to get into agriculture? So. The way I do it at my farm is, fine, you've come, you've told me your husband is not going to allow you to access the assets and control them. Mm -hmm. Have you thought of leasing land? Because I don't think there's any husband who will tell you you cannot go leasing land because it's your own charma investment, you can go and lease land. And I'm a living example because to date, I do not have any title deed to my name. So I have leased a one point something acre farm in Kikuyu. I pay 10,000 Kenya shillings per year. And I strongly believe from the young to the women to everybody can access land for leasing, even if it is a charma, they'll come together as women and they're going to invest in agriculture. So I think, yes, the government is doing something. But I think the way they communicate the interventions is a bit NGO speak, boardroom speak. It needs to trickle down. And the reality on the ground is when you say women should access uh, financing, mm -hmm. How do they access that financing? Yet they cannot control the assets that are owned by the husband. Okay. So going forward, what, what, what do we need to do as a country? Uh, from where I see it, I think that we need to have conversations from the ground up. Agriculture has been devolved. I'm waiting to see um, agriculture extension officers. And we can get a pull from the TVETs or from the universities that we have from the county level. We, dis we send them out there. Because there's the day that uh, the word of the agricultural extension officer was almost low. But nowadays we are bombarded with a lot of information, be it on social media, be it on traditional media. Mm -hmm. We need to separate the wheat from the shaft. We say, okay, 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 there's too much information going on. The government is saying this, Ketani is saying this, everybody is saying this. Can we have one central place where we get information from? Because I strongly believe it's not that we have a production problem mm -hmm. per se. We have a logistical problem. That's what we have in Kenya. And logistics could be as small as um, how do we get this information trickled down to my grandmother in okay. her own language. Okay. Yeah. Also, you've talked about the extension officers. Yes. I think we need to talk more about the extension. Because I remember, as you've s rightly put it, yeah. the extension officers were very powerful those days. Yes. What happened to the extension officers? Where did we go wrong? Funding. 
we started, I think we started looking at agriculture as, and I'm going to say a statement that not many people will agree with me, but let me say nevertheless. Agriculture is seen as high risk, low return. Mm -hmm. By people across both state and non-state actors. So if you're not spending money or putting a budgetary allocation, as you had promised 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago actually, in the Malabo Declaration, African governments, and Kenya was one of them, committed to set aside 10% of the national budget towards agriculture. We are at 2.9%. I mean, we are barely scratching the surface. Now, we are saying agriculture is the backbone of our economy, contributing 26% of the GDP, directly and 27 indirectly. Yet, we are not investing the same industry or the same sector that is, has the potential to employ very many people, be it directly or indirectly. So, I think when it comes to the setting aside of the budget, the government should stop seeing the politics of agriculture. Look at maize. Look at fertilizer. That's what every agriculture minister will come and say. F finally, for the last time, we've had someone talking about locusts, which we'll talk about later. But every agriculture minister, the first thing they say when they in office is, is about fertilizers maize. And, and maize. I'm asking myself, if you did serious R&D, research and development on the best cassava variety, on the best yam variety, arrowroot varieties, and sweet potato varieties, then we are going to rope in the non-food producing counties, we rope them in the bread basket. But we cannot be saying that the bread basket of this country is a Rift Valley region. Marsabit, Wajia, Turkana, they also have something to offer, but we need to set aside that 10% we are saying, some money should go to R&D in all those counties. So we say, you're good in fish or aquaculture, focus on that. Your competitive advantage is say uh, cassava farming. Go big on that one. That we start processing the cassava to flour for livestock production. I totally agree with you and I and I want to believe that it's true we need information and prior information that we can plan with that information in mind. Mm -hmm. But having said that, mm -hmm. there is something that we are given a warning about. Mm -hmm. We had inf prior information about that it was coming, but we did nothing about. Yes. Now let's look at it. The Food and Agricultural Organization is warning that the ongoing locust invasion in the country is posing a serious food security threat. The organization says it has placed the locust invasion at level three emergency, saying it is the worst case scenario to hit Kenya in the past 70 years. The Agriculture Ministry added that it will take at least six months to control the locust, highlighting the threat to food security. Changamoto kubwa ni kwamba sehemu sehemu ambazo ziko ni sehemu ziko remote sana. Kwa hiyo inabidi uende masafa marefu sana. Sasa ingine hakuna network kama sasa hapa tunataka kuambia wale walio wa, na ndege waje hapa lakini hakuna network. Kwa hiyo hakuna njia ya kuwasiliana. Halafu zina, kila kila siku kuna makundi yanavuka mpaka kuingia. Kwa hivyo resources zinakuwa stretched. Kwa sababu tuko na ndege tano, tuko na helikopta nne lakini county ni tisa. Kwa vile huyu mdudu huwa hayupo hapa nchini. Dawa zake pia hawa wanaweka dawa, hawaeki nyingi. Kwa sababu wakiweka inakuwa kama hasara. Unaweka kitu ambayo itakuja baada ya miaka 20. Kwa hivyo hivi sasa ndio wengine wanaagiza. Sasa kila tukienda madukani tunaona hazipo, lakini pengine hii wiki tuna stock ambayo tunaitumia, lakini hii wiki tuliwaambia waongeze stock kwa sababu ja, eh, tatizo lenyewe litakuwa hapa kama miezi miwili mitatu. Caleb. Mm -hmm. We just talked about having prior information yes. and and planning mm -hmm. to to the information that you have. Yeah. The information about the locust. Mm -hmm. Food and Agricultural Organization FAO yeah. warned us like in November or September last yeah. year yeah. that it is going to to come. Yeah. We did nothing. Mm -hmm. Now we are complaining. Mm -hmm. The locusts are here, mm -hmm. we are not able to tame them. Yeah. What does that say about us as a country uh, and the people involved? Uh, you know, if you put someone in charge of agriculture and they have zero passion for it, they have nothing to lose, really, as long as they get a paycheck at the end of the month, mm. 
then they will gather information and they will sit on it, they will not act on it. I would rather investigate if I was in charge, make phone calls to the surrounding countries, have you received a similar warning, and what can we do jointly? But there appears to be, we are more, uh, we react, we fire fight, something we could have controlled. Having said that, uh, I'm also finding even the interventions we are having now are short term. When you start saying we make uh, 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 poultry feeds from the locusts, <laughs> how sustainable is that? Because it's, it's a knee-jerk reaction to something you could have prevented long time ago. So these early warning systems, mm -hmm. if they are given region-wide or per country, <clears throat> then was there a communication that trickled down to even me as a farmer that, hey, whatever you are planting right now, locusts are going to come in the next two, three months, and they're going to have this impact. Now they are saying they do not even have uh, time or money uh, to procure their bureaucracies, to procure the pesticides. I mean, you, you're talking about bureaucracy? A phone call will suffice. Just make a phone call and get the pesticides done. This one tells me someone is either going, is fumbling this situation so that we can produce some locust millionaires. Okay. So we'll leave it at that for now. I'm sure we'll still continue having this conversation on the locust. Okay. Now let's look at another topic. The county government of Makueni has launched a rigorous campaign toward the establishment of fruit fly free zones with, within the county. The two-year campaign that was launched last week in the county agricultural training institute provides an opportunity for various actors in the mango value chain to interact and kick off activities geared towards reducing the mango losses due to fruit fly infestation. It is estimated that fruit flies cause losses of fruits and vegetables estimated at $2 billion in Africa through direct damage. Speaking while flagging off the six-day roadshow that is aimed at raising awareness on the fruit fly campaign, Makweni County Governor Kivutha Kibwana revealed that the outcomes of this campaign is expected to stimulate mango export and increase incomes for mango farmers and other value chain actors. Ni campaign ya maana sana hii tutashinda makueni kwa sababu kila mkulima itakuwa sasa ni jukumu letu uh, kuhifadhi miti yake ya matunda plus even the watermelons plus because it affects all those others we will do this and i really commit myself and adelina has committed herself uh, maalim all of us who are here on the ground and i'm sure our mps and our mcas uh, we will all uh, work together so that the support ya wadamini hawa wetu tunafanya kazi na wao ina ina inakuwa ya maana uh, kwa sisi remember hao watu wamekutana hapa karibu mara saba nikiangalia nilikutana kuanzia tukaenda mapping kwa na msemu zile tunaona tutaanza kama kupilot kuangalia ile process ndio tukue pest free zones so hiyo ni safari tunaanza the campaign, which is sponsored by several players, among them Makweni and Kitui governments, will sensitize farmers on economic benefits of applying modern pest management technologies to curb the damage caused by fruit flies on the mango fruit. USAID believes that the true purpose of foreign aid that comes through USAID and other donors is to end the need for its existence, that our people can be able to do these things by themselves. And so by engaging in this kind of partnerships, of uh, many that have spoken here to support efforts like the fruit, free, uh, fruit fly free zone in Makwene County, we are supporting Kenya on what we believe and talk about at USAID today as supporting Kenya on its journey to self-reliance. This campaign will help raise awareness among the farmers on economic benefits of applying environmentally friendly pest management technologies helping smallholder farmers produce high quality mangoes and, minim and, 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 and minimize the post-harvest losses. Through this campaign, as well as establishment of the zone in Makweni and eventually in Kitui, we expect that Kenya will achieve export market compliance into the European market and others and increase the export market share for mangoes by 30% and hopefully in the first year. 
This is huge for communities that USAID cares about in Makweni and Kenya as a whole. This campaign will improve the profits and livelihoods of smallholder farmers and ultimately contribute to putting Kenya on the path to sustainable prosperity. The effort, therefore, represents a significant partnership between national and county governments, donors, civil society, private sector, and the media to improve household livelihoods and spur economic growth. This cannot be done by only one organization, but it's an effort that we all have to work on together. Through the Feed the Future project at USAID, we will invest at least 64 million Kenya shillings in the fruit fly campaign in Makwene and Kitui counties. The resources will be used in the coordination of the media campaign, as we have seen starting, grants to integrated pest management uh, service providers and mango cooperatives for training farmers and behavior change communication around the adoption of improved fruit fly management and mango production technologies. In addition, USAID will also work on ex extensive mango productivity enhancement, not only in Makweni, but other parts of the country. We are faced with the reality of climate change that is uh, making things worse, exacerbating the incidence and frequency of pests and diseases across the country. A scenario that is complicating our strategies to increase agricultural exports to external markets, which we have, we have heard about the EU and the Middle East. So the ministry therefore fully encourages the concept of pest-free area, which is a proven management approach for mobile pests around the world. This approach includes employing a united strategy to target pest, a pest habitat within a well-defined area or region to reduce and eradicate the total pest population. The advantage of managing pests using a, 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 a pest-free area model is that pest-free areas can offer a long-term solution to agricultural pest problems as opposed to quick fix solutions on individual crops or farms that happens in most cases in this country. It is in this regard that we encourage collaboration and working together of all. Mango is currently the second most common fruit produced in Kenya after banana. According to Kenya Plant Health Inspectorate Service, CAFIS, mango is grown on 49,098 hectares, producing 779,147 metric tons, valued at 11.9 billion Kenya shillings, and accounts for about 21% of the total value of fruits produced in Kenya. Reporting for Farmers TV, I'm Jacqueline Kemunto. <laughs> This is another intake that has been with us for a very long time. We've not been able to tame uh, the fruit fly. Yes. And remember, this is the mango season. Yeah. Why do you think this one has been very difficult to, to control all these years? Um, from the, I would say the casual look of it, um, it's in the mango zones, uh, the mango growing zones rather, there are those large scale uh, mango uh, producers or mango farmers. So they'll have the money to buy the pesticides and they will do spring on their lot. But the problem is the smallholder farmer. Oh, okay. The smallholder farmer will either buy chemicals to spray when it's a bit too late. The intervention for them is, I have seen the fruit fly, let me go and spray. Mm -hmm. But the large scale farmer who is doing it as a business will have done preventative. Uh -huh. So if, uh, if you neighbor <laughs> such a farmer, large scale farmer, they have spread, they've done, they've protected their, their farm. So the fruit flies are going to look for a host, uh, another place, they will come to your farm. So if we are not synchronizing, and I'm a proponent of this, if you know there is an invasion of fruit flies in your region, in your world, in your village, this is where the agricultural extension officers come into play. There should be synchronized spring. If we say 
We are starting from Mombasa Road all the way to Wayakiwe. Let's all do it at the same time. The chemicals that we are using, one is using an inferior chemical, the one is using a superior chemical because they can afford it probably. Um, you find again, even the timing that you are spraying. I told you, I met a farmer in Baringo who was spraying against fruit flies at around 1 p.m. At that particular time, the fruit flies by 8 a.m. they were gone because once the wings uh, get some warmth, they will fly away when they can smell the pesticide. So even that you could be using the right pesticide mm -hmm. for the fruit flies, but the application is very wrong. So where, does, where do they need to get this information that you already have? You, you are passing it to them. Mm -hmm. How comes that particular farmer mm -hmm. is in the county? The county has an agricultural extension officer. Mm -hmm. The agricultural extension officer is going to demand for a thousand shillings to fill the motorbike to go and tell them that. <laughs> no, no, you know, you know we have, let me tell you, Ketani, I'm a, I'm a black and white. I will tell you, this is what is going on on the ground. Mm -hmm. I ask people, so why didn't you accept that information? And it appears, this is my statement, it appears agricultural, agricultural extension of, of officers or, or services are demand driven. Mm -hmm. It's, I want it, I have the problem. I go look for it. It's supposed to be the other way around. It's supposed to be disseminating the information before I have the need for it. And with that, I think we'll take a short commercial break okay. just to digest uh, the conversation we've had. We've been very candid, and I'm sure our viewers are benefiting from this. So don't change that dial. We'll be back shortly.